Thank you. My name is Don Wall. I serve on the Central School District Board of Directors. I have the privilege of serving as the chair right now, uh, as of a month ago, and I am definitely excited about the uh, prospects of this activity. Um, seems like every time we try to look forward into the future, it gets a little scary, but it's exciting to uh, be making plans or, or at least talking about making plans to make sure we can meet the needs of the community and the kids uh, in the years to come. So I'm glad to be here. And I will pick Emily. Thanks, Don. I'm Emily Menzer. I'm the communications coordinator with Central School District. And I am here because anything I can do to help communicate the, pro the process and, you know, volunteer people like Byron. So, you know. <laughs> uh, Emily, will you pick someone? Oh, let's go with Isabel. Let me know if you can hear me. Okay, good. Um, so my name is Isabel and I'm a school-based mental health therapist. And while I'm contracted, I work for Polk County. I work I work full-time in Central School District. So, um, and I also have kids in the school. So um, this, as a parent, also this is important to me. So, and Emily asked me, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's go with Jennifer. Uh, good evening, all. Jennifer Kabist. I'm the superintendent of Central School District. Uh, honored to serve in that, that role and um, have really been excited for this. Uh, we've gone through a lot of already stages of this and I'm at, to that point of excited to share with this group to help us really formalize what that long range plan uh, is. It is needed. Um, we are almost back to pre-COVID thus far in our enrollment. And obviously with, um, you know, we'll know a little bit more of that as we um, get here and uh, enrollment is starting to, to come in and, and we'll continue to through August. Um, we are a growing town. That's why some of our city people are on here as well. Uh, and really looking at what the future is, um, you know, within our community. So just excited to listen in uh, to our community and the, the voices of our schools as we go through this process for a long range plan. And then I am going to go to Shannon Ball. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. I'm Shannon Ball. I have two children in the school district. One's gonna be a freshman and one's gonna be in junior high. And I volunteered to be on this because I have an, uh, an interest in seeing our schools continue to improve and grow. So um, next is Nicole. Hi, <clears throat> Nicole Smith, principal of Independence Elementary School. And um, I see the growing population in my school and in the neighborhood around me that most likely there will be uh, children. Um, and then I also think a lot about the safety of my staff. And so um, I'm excited to see um, the collaboration here in the planning. And I'm going to say Kim Seidel. Hello, I'm Kim Seidel and I am the principal at Monmouth Elementary School. And I have three students as well, two at the high school and one at Monmouth Elementary for one last year. And I'm also a community member. So um, I feel like this conversation and this planning is important to not only me as a principal, but to our family and our community. And is there anyone left that hasn't been called? Yes, uh, we've got Julie, Andrea. We'll go for Julie, thanks. Nope. Hi, I just stuck a message in the chat box. I don't have video at this time, so I apologize. Um, but I'm Julie Heilman. I'm an administrator with the Department of Teaching and Learning within the school district. Um, I'm super excited to learn and contribute within this process as much as I can um, or anything I can do. And I don't know, I, you're saying another person's name, um, who else has not gone yet? Well, that's okay. I'm going to uh, ask for that prompt because I need a prompt. Kenna. Have we met Kenna? We have not met Kenna yet. 
Now you get to meet Kenna. Um, I am the new city manager for the city of Independence, and I am extraordinarily excited and, and honored to have the opportunity to work with you on this. You know, the cities and the schools, we, we have to work together for our joint communities. And I think these projects help us to um, help our kids for the future. So I, I'm extraordinarily honored and thankful to be a part of West Bank. Mayor Kuntz has not gone yet, so I'll call on her. Thank you, Ken. Um, I am Cease Kuntz. I, I'm actually on the call as the Director of Finance and Operations for the Central School District, but Kenna is uh, certainly <laughs> hard for her not to call me Mayor Kuntz as the Mayor of Monmouth, which also informs my participation on this, obviously. Um, you know, <clears throat> having gone through this a couple of times as a parent and community member, and now uh, sort of my second time around as the Director of Finance and Operations, I think really determining what we need, what we um, finding out how the community perceives those needs is a huge lift. And um, I just, I am very excited about the work Rick has done and is doing to help us through that. So really happy to, to see other folks join us in this process. <clears throat> um, and I am going to ask Miss Andrea Van Huysack to talk to us about her participation, a big partner at the school district. Thanks, Cease. Um, hi, my name is Andrea Van Heeswick, and I'm the director for the Monmouth Independence YMCA. And being that one of our areas of focus is youth development and that we run youth programming in the school district and in the community, I'm very excited to be here and support and help and collaborate in any way that I can be. Thank you. Uh, Allison, I don't think you've gone yet. Hey folks, I'm Allison Brown. I'm with Brick Architecture. Today in my role, I'm going to be helping you all take notes uh, of this meeting. So I may ask you if I really can't hear something uh, to, to repeat it or maybe, maybe drop a comment in the chat. I uh, am not an architect, but I work on, with, on planning projects with Elisa and Karina, and I'm a former educator. So I um, believe very strongly in the power that space has to affect um, students and their lives and their families. And it's really fun to be involved in these projects where we get to think big and envision the future and look forward. So stoked to be here with y'all and thank you. Okay. That leaves Brian Weatherly. Hey, Cease. Thank you, Cease. I'm Brian Weatherly. I'm the facilities manager. Um, I kind of think I might be a key player in this whole role. I kind of know what, have a pretty good understanding of what our needs are currently. Um, the buildings that we have, what they need to improve and to grow um, and to stay safe. So that's kind of my role in it. Okay. We heard from Shannon or Nicole. Yes. Okay. Good deal. Okay. I think we um, will you actually go back to the agenda. Um, please, Miss Lisa. Thank you. So um, yeah, I mean, partly, you know, we're here um, to get to know one another um, in this process to talk a little bit about kind of what the roles are of members of the, the long range facilities plan, what kind of the, the goal of the document is to talk a little bit about kind of some group norms um, and kind of what the what the meeting schedule is going to be. Um, and then kind of review the highlights from we did some stakeholder engagement in the spring. Um, uh, we talked about this a little bit with the school board, so you, so you may be familiar with this, but we did what we called kind of listening and learning sessions where we really tried to um, meet with um, a, a lot of your constituency students, um, teachers, parents, um, staff members, community members to, to get a better understanding of kind of what are the micro problems that we're trying to solve, right? Um, not necessarily thinking exclusively of facilities, but just Kind of, if especially if we look to folks who have been traditionally um, with social identities, traditionally in the margins, what do we need to do to ensure um, that they, their children, their families have what they need to succeed? And so we'll share with you some of the highlights that came from those, kind of some key themes that came out of that. Um, and then we will also start of start to look forward, right? So start to think about 
if we're thinking about um, the next generation learner, right? The what what has historically in the past been called the 21st century learner. But um, for especially for those of us that haven't been in the classroom in a long time, um, it helps to kind of ground us in, um, you know, what what do we need to do, or what are some thoughts that can help us think about how we can prepare um, kids to to meet the world um, as it exists today and as it will exist tomorrow. And then we'll um, take a moment, just kind of we'll go into breakout rooms to really do some visioning around. Okay, then what? Right. What is what kind of opportunities, what kind of experiences do you want um, for the kids and families um, in in the school district and then um, share back with one another. I will say that this meeting more than any other um, is a bit odd in that um, there'll be a lot of I'm going to call it kind of ground setting or, or, or presentation from us, which is not normally how I like to do these meetings. Right. It's, it's we recognize it's not how we learn. It's not how we um, communicate best. Uh, so I also want this to be interactive. If you have questions, if you kind of want to stop and say, hey, can we talk about this or throw something in the chat? Um, also want to encourage you to participate in whatever means um, work what best for you, right? If that's in the chat, if that is, you know, kind of raising your hand or if that's just kind of blurting it out there, then um, any of those is, is fine. Um, because we're going to be a community together for the next, you know, few months as we do this. So excited about that. Um, Lisa, do you want to take us through kind of the roles and responsibilities of a long range facilities plan? Yeah, um, yeah why don't you do that part? Okay. Um, so um, a long range facilities plan, um, one of the, you know, the key purposes of that is to just um, simply summarize the district's facilities needs over the next 10 plus years. Um, but it's not um, just about the facility conditions per se, it's also about how well those facilities um, support your teaching and learning goals, right? So there's, um, there's a, a higher level analysis that occurs, um, planning for the future, envisioning the types of experiences that you want to create for your students, and um, how the facility can help you get there. Um, and it um, it can provide a foundation for future bond planning. Um, it doesn't always. Um, the state actually requires that school districts um, prepare a long-range facilities plan every 10 years. Um, but uh, it is um, oftentimes um, time to coincide with bond planning because um, it does inform that process. Um, so uh, the purpose of this committee is um, to help us develop the plan, but most importantly, it's um, establishing the capital improvement plan. And that is actually the, the list of all of the different facilities projects that are to be accomplished um, over the next 10 plus years and um, the, the rough order in which those should occur. And um, it's important to note that the, the Long Range Facilities Planning Committee, it's an advisory committee, it's not a decision-making body. Ultimately, the school board will make decisions, but this committee will be instrumental in developing recommendations that will be presented to the school board um, for, um, for adoption as part of the plan. Um, and so in terms of the roles and responsibilities, we ask um, that uh, you actively participate in committee meetings. Um, I, for, for now, the meetings will be virtual. Um, we are remaining agile um, if, you know, the, um, if the need to meet in person um, were to arise during the course of this project, um, we're able to do so, but for now, um, virtual is the plan. And, um, and also to serve as an advocate for the process within the community and uh, with your colleagues and within your, your neighborhoods. So, um, you know, we, we try, of course, um, to build consensus, um, but, you know, we want you to, um, at, at least at the very minimum, feel like the process um, was was fair and comprehensive that um, we were able to to hear from everybody and that you felt like um, it was something that was very worthwhile and that you had buy in in the final solution. Thanks, Elisa. Yeah, I mean the keys. You know, a lot of a lot of you come, um, you know, see primarily with with many hats, and so you have many sort of interests um, to to represent here as as kind of. Um, representatives, if you will, of your community. And oftentimes that means that kind of you can come to it, you know, I, I'm thinking of, you know, whether it's because your kids go to a particular school to really kind of say, hey, we need these things at this school. And, and so as we go through these exercises, um, the hope is that we're able to kind of peel back a little bit, think big picture, think kind of future for the district as a whole, 
and then um, serve as an advocate, like I said, in your community for, for the work that we're doing here. Next. Um, so I talked a little bit about kind of some, some group um, agreements and, and how, um, what I like to say is how we'll be in community together, right, as we think about this work moving forward. And so um, we started with some that we worked with um, when we did some of the listening and learning in the spring. But um, can everyone see the screen or should I read these aloud? Does anyone need me to read these aloud? Okay, I'm gonna let y'all read them on the screen um, and we'll go from there. any questions or um, want to poke at any of these, right? Um, but kind of wanted to be sure that, that you have full understanding of what one means or um, want to add anything. Is there anything you feel that you need um, in order to, to kind of be in community with us for the next few months as we do this work? Is there anything on here that you take issue with that you don't want to see on here that you want to um, want to talk about further? Okay, I'm going to take that as thumbs up then. Um, so yeah, so we'll kind of revisit these every meeting just to kind of ground us in the work that we're doing. Um, and uh, with that, I will kind of carry us forward. So um, we'll talk a little bit about kind of the, the schedule that we have. As Elisa said, we're trying to remain um, agile and still provide um, kind of that balance of what times can, um, we need to kind of call you together. Um, we will likely always offer a hybrid option for, for folks that um, just feel um, that it works better for them um, to, to be virtual. But there may be times, uh, depending on kind of where we are in our um, in the joy that is the COVID um, roller coaster, um, about whether or not we we will come together in person. But for now, we're we're thinking that these are going to be virtual, um, and we'll go from there. So, first meeting today, like I said, is really to to think about and and start to um, create a vision for the opportunities and experience we want for your students. Um, and then we will come back together um, in a couple of weeks to do a couple of things. One is to start to say, okay. Here are the conditions of our facilities. Um, here is what we learned in the educational adequacy interviews that were conducted in the spring. Um, and then based on the work that we do today, here's our first draft of what we call kind of guiding principles for, for the process. Ensure that um, those have, that those are in alignment with where you are. And then most importantly say, okay, so now what are the implications to space and place and specifically to capital improvement projects, right? If this is the, if these are the guiding principles that we want um, to to encompass for the next 10, 10 years in the district, what does that mean? Does that mean we have to, you know, build a new school? Does that mean we have to um, add CTE STEM spaces? What do those kinds of things mean? I'm going to pause there only because I just caught myself doing something that um, that didn't end up in our group norms. But architects are almost as bad as educators in terms of acronyms. So if I throw something out and you're like, what is that? Again, please, um, if anybody does, just, just uh, uh, we wanna be sure that everyone's working from the same sort of shared vocabulary. Um, and um, and yeah, just wants to kind of carry that forward. So if, if ever anyone throws out an acronym that you need uh, more clarity around, just, um, just let us know. Uh, um, the and then we have two additional meetings. We're um, going to talk about getting those calendars later on today. But um, a, another huge component of the long range plan is just your enrollment projections and capacity data, right? So how how quickly are you growing? Are you growing? Are you shrinking? And then how well equipped are your existing facilities from a capacity standpoint um, uh, able to handle that growth or constriction, right? Um, and then really start to get into the capital planning development um, and looking at, you know, kind of what we identify as tier one, tier two, and um, tier three projects in terms of priority um, to position you 
to number one, um, carry this forward into a future bond, but more importantly, just to kind of, again, create that, um, the, the big term uh, facilities plan for the next 10 years. Um, and then the, the final meeting is really just, okay, now that we um, have talked about what all of these projects could be, let's finalize around a capital improvement plan. Let's look at what the dollars um, tell us that's gonna entail and kind of wrap up um, the work of the committee. Does anyone have any questions about that process? Yeah, Mark Gerard here. Yeah, Mark. I'm interested in understanding a little bit more about, I guess this is really asking you to look into the future a little bit. In, in experience with long range uh, planning like this, how often does, how often is there a negative intersection between the plan and the ability of the community to raise money? And or what have you seen in the past relative to the plan and intersection with things like deferred maintenance and, and things that we just have to deal with that sideline the ability to move forward on the plan? You know what I mean? Can you talk sure. a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so, yeah, so there there is kind of a, a very traditional kind of sequence of work, right? The first is understanding where you are, right, which is the facilities assessment and the educational facilities, educational adequacy assessment. So that works behind us. Um, getting an understanding of what your community needs are, you know, in terms of kind of that, um, your student and teacher and community assessment in terms of the listening and learning. So that's work that has, has already um, occurred. And then we're in the phase that we're in now, which is kind of a big picture beyond one bond, kind of let's look at what um, what a what a school district, what, you, what your school district is going to want and need for the next 10 years, knowing that um, that that that's really kind of expecting you to to look into a crystal ball. Right. We, we don't know where we're going to be 10 years from now. We don't know what education is going to be. We don't know kind of what what the city is going to be. But given all of the information that we have, how can we best prepare ourselves, our students, our district to do, to look at that? And as part of that, develop a capital improvement plan, which starts to then talk about, here's how we think we need to improve our facilities, build new facilities, expand, whatever those things are. And, but yet not saying, so that means that in two years, we're gonna go for this bond and in eight years, we're gonna go for this bond. That really is the purpose of a bond development committee. Um, so that's where kind of our work ends. And potentially if you, if at the end of this, you decide, the school board decides, yeah, we want to kind of carry this forward and think about how to actualize some of this. Then you start looking at um, a variety of funding sources. So that's where you look at what do we need just to day to day, like oftentimes some of those tier one projects are things that just can't wait anymore because there's a leaky roof or, you know, there's there's a immediate what, what you call kind of deferred maintenance, which is um, for those of you that aren't aware of how schools get funded, the school districts, school districts across the state get very few dollars to um, to put into facilities, right, short of a bond. Um, there are some grant programs um, for specifically for seismic retrofitting and for some of the other planning work. But for the most part, um, in Oregon, we rely on local dollars to help us kind of do big lifts in terms of capital facilities. Um, and so the, the point that Mark was asking is at some point that is dependent on what your community is willing to tax themselves to allow you to do, right? Because it's a, a general obligation bond that is the vehicle that you use to get there. That work becomes the work of the uh, a future bond development committee um, beyond us. What we do in this process, Mark, is we lay out the plan and we lay out the plan in a way that is... Um, is, you know, we call them tiers, but it's prioritized such that whenever you move in that phase, then you can start to have the conversation that is trying to balance what your need is, what your community can tolerate in terms of a dollar value um, to tax themselves, and in terms of what like your bonding capacity is, right? So that's all work that kind of happens um, kind of after our work is, is completed. Does that make sense, Mark? Yep, that's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and part, I would just add too, part of that bond planning phase um, usually will include um, community polling and um, 
one of the advantages of having um, a detailed long range facilities plan is, um, you know, they can, you can take some of those projects that were identified as tier one or very important to the committee and um, and present them in a poll and find out gauge, you know, the, the level of support for those specific projects. Um, so that's that's also a helpful thing. Yeah. All right, Lisa, why don't you walk us through what the requirements are of a long range plan? Because as Elisa said, this is a requirement if you want to get any funds to do anything related with facilities you're required by the state every 10 years to create a, a long-range plan and some of those requirements are pretty detailed and so Lisa's is going to walk you through what some of those are yeah and much of this so a lot of this is happening behind the scenes right and um, as this committee work um continues but um but we'll be sharing a lot of this information with you during the course of our work together so um some of these we've already talked about or we or actually have already been completed um that population projections um by school for the next 10 years so the district has contracted uh, with flow analytics um to do enrollment projections um uh, Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you have the preliminary report and are waiting on the final one. Is that correct? Correct. And I'm going to I'm going to lean on Cease a little bit because she's been the lead on that. But yes, we have preliminary uh, numbers to be able to share out in the future here. Terrific. Cease, anything to add? Yeah, no, just that we're uh, mm -hmm. I, we've been trying to get a few folks together to review the preliminary. Um, and test some assumptions, and that's just been difficult. So we will try be trying again in the next week or so to get some dates out to people, some of whom are on this call. <laughs> that's great. And you'll hear more about this later, but it's, you know, it's a difficult time to um, actually conduct enrollment projections because um, a, a big piece of that is um, looking at historical trends and um, the last few years have been anything but typical. Um, so it creates uh, kind of a quandary there with, you know, how much do you do you base um, what's been happening over the last few years um, when you're trying to make projections looking forward. So that's... Uh, that's been interesting. Um, educational adequacy assessments of school facilities, um, those have been conducted. We interviewed each of um, your school principals and toured the facilities um, to uh, document uh, the degree to which those um, facilities are working for um, from a teaching and learning standpoint for you right now. Capacity analyses of the school facilities, that will be um, kind of juxtaposed with the enrollment projections to show you how well your school facilities will be able to handle um, any enrollment fluctuations pr um, predicted over the next decade. Um, a descri a descriptions of physical improvements needed. So um, the district um, hired a, a firm to conduct enroll, uh, sorry, building condition assessments uh, last, uh, no, 2021, I guess it was, right? I think, yes, yeah, spring of last year, yes. Um, and so those have um, been completed and we have that information and that will be, the highlights will be shared with you at the next meeting. Um, and then um, if there's any plan uh, to construct um, a school on a new site, uh, then uh, it'll include information about um, potential uh, school sites or um, site acquisition plans in some cases. So um, there's a, a requirement of documenting um, that we've coordinated with um, local uh, government planning agencies. And um, so that's you know, some of you that are here with us today, uh, part of that process as well. Um, stakeholder outreach, we have started that. And um, this committee is also part of our stakeholder outreach, but we've also um, completed a series of listening learning dialogue sessions like Karina mentioned, and we're gonna go through those with you here shortly. Identification of historic buildings. Um, so I think you may <laughs> have some of those. Um, and uh, financial plans. Um, we, on this uh, item, we have information on your, uh, your building condition assessments um, related to the deferred maintenance items that were identified. And so that uh, will be shared with you as well. You'll have it, you'll be able to see uh, the projected cost um, to actually address those deferred maintenance projects and um, also um, get an understanding um, if you, there's something called a facility condition index and it is the um, basically gives you an indication if it's uh, more cost effective after a certain point to uh, renovate or replace a facility and so you'll have some information um, shared with you related to that. 
um, talk about alternatives to new construction um, or major renovation and, you know, kind of touches on Mark's question a little bit too, because, you know, oftentimes, um, I would say every time actually needs exceed um, uh, resources <laughs> when we're looking at, um, at these, uh, these uh, plans. And so um, we like have a section that strategizes ways that certain needs can be met, um, even without the investment of significant capital uh, dollars. Um, and uh, efficient use of sites, same kind of principle, and then 10-year um, capital improvement plan, which is where um, you all come in and you're going to help us develop that. Lisa, any questions about kind of the, the, the regulatory requirements is what I'll say uh, of this stuff. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit redundant because I think we've said this a few times, but the, the, you aren't starting from scratch, right? There's work you've already done. We will review those in greater detail. Um, Emily just published the link to the facility condition assessment that was done in the spring of 2021. Educational adequacy assessments of all schools were also conducted. We'll share that content with you in our next meeting. Um, as, uh, as both uh, Emily and Jennifer said, um, we have preliminary reports um, from a demographer on kind of what your enrollment projections are for that kind of 10 year window um, that we will um, get to look at and kind of finalize. And then we also went through um, before uh, school wrapped up uh, in, in the spring and had some conversations that, that you'll be hearing about just after this about kind of what what are what could we hear from your community about what you wanted and what you needed. Okay, so that's kind of where we're, that's the, the work we've done to date. So we want to share with you um, kind of these, these themes. Um, we held uh, five engagement sessions in um, March, from March to May of, of this year, earlier this year. And again, we were really kind of intentional in that work at that time of trying to ensure that we were working um, and hearing from folks who are most impacted by educational inequity, right? For whatever reason. And so um, we talked with emerging bilingual families. We met with Mecha students. We had just an open student, a series of sessions with students um, at the high school. Um, we met with your district equity committee and we also held open sessions for families, right? And so in addition to that, we um, held um, or we distributed a survey that kind of um, modeled those same kinds of questions, just recognizing that quite frankly, that was a better vehicle to try and get input from folks um, to hear from your migrant families. Again, this was in uh, multiple languages um, and it was both in printed form, so take it home in backpacks, and then also in um, digital format uh, to reach your migrant families and your SPED families. Um, because we recognized very uh, early on in planning this that those were those were folks who tried to bring them to an engagement session we weren't necessarily going to get um, as as big an impact as we wanted. So what we wanted to start to do is just kind of share with you um, what we heard from those. And so the format of these, and there are a few of these. So again, um, I ask you to bear with me because um, I'm going to be speaking at you much more than I'd, I'd like to do or want to do. But we want to share with you kind of what are some of the key themes that came out of that. What you'll see in all of these is kind of a big theme. That's what's in bold at the top of each sheet. Um, a, uh, a series of, for lack of a better term, for bullet points that kind of are illustrative of that theme based on what we heard. And then always to the right, some pull quotes that were taken firsthand um, from uh, folks that we met with, okay? So I'm probably not gonna read every single one of these, but I do kind of wanna give you the highlights, right? So um, what we heard is the need to invest in both flexible and adaptable, recognizing that those things are different, uh, features and furnishings in a building that support the needs of all your learners, right? Um, to think about, how do you change space to look at different groupings or different sizes of spaces? How do you take spaces themselves and break them up? How do you have kind of intent and purpose for all of those pieces um, to build on um, whether it's group building or sing, you know, um, working by yourself or working in teams? 
And also what type of working you're doing. Are you doing science exploration? Are you doing project-based work? Are you doing um, kind of direct instruction? And, and recognizing that the scale of those needs to feel welcoming and safe um, and that, the, that different people oftentimes um, based on their social identities um, can experience different spaces in the same space in different ways, right? So um, I just even looking at introverts and extroverts, right? Like I am perfectly happy and kind of a loud open space where people are kind of collaborating together knowing my dear friend, Elisa, she's like, give me a quiet corner where I can sit by myself with my book and, you know, kind of take my notes and we just learn different ways. Right. And so we know if you multiply that across your district, you need not only the building features, the building, the, the, the physical elements of the building, but also the furniture um, to allow for students to, um, to experience that in different ways and to, to sit in different configurations to move um, as best they can. Any questions about this one? Okay. Next one is about providing um, engaging school environments. Again, that support hands-on learning and uh, what we call CTE or uh, career technical education. So, right, there's um, kind of a recognized disconnect between some CTE courses and elective course offerings and what students want to learn, right? So there was a, a big push on like, let's get some alignment around that and ask students kind of what they want to do. And also an understanding though, that it isn't just about what students want, but we're also trying to prepare folks for what we call kind of high wage, high demand jobs, right? And so what does your community need as well um, from, from future um, workforce? Um, yeah, and then expose kids as, as best you can, provide different experiences so that kids can um, get a, a, a better idea of what's available for them and allow them to have different um, experiences and not just relative to CTE, but across kind of all of the, the elective offerings um, that we wanted students to, um, to not be afraid to take risks, right? To create places where, you know, we say failure, um, but to to have some trial and error, right, and encourage them to really uh, not be afraid to to push the button, um, and and that really starts to allow students to kind of create that the problem solving, the self starting, the autonomy that kind of goes into that, um, and then also recognizing that while we talk about kind of um, CTE, there's just some some need for some adulting classes, for lack of a better term, right? We heard a lot around. Um, financial um, kind of literacy and, you know, how do I do my laundry and, you know, cook and what are those things that I'm going to need to do as an adult and how can I better be prepared so that way when I go off to college for my first year or when I'm in the military or when I'm working, I, I have what I need to, to be able to do that in a way and take care of myself. Um, provide culturally expressive, multilingual, inclusive environments, again, where students of all abilities um, and, uh, and backgrounds and, and identities um, feel seen, value, and represented. I will say um, that in the work that we've done in your schools, you are already doing so much of this work, right? Um, we, as you also hear that it's not enough, right? They want more, but um, I just want to take a moment to kind of applaud you um, in, in some of the work that you're already doing, Jennifer, especially you with um, some of the work that you're doing in this regard, but just, you know, provide space for kids, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, ability, culture, religion, language, I think I might've hit them all, um, but to, to really feel that they that they belong and that they're safe and that they feel welcome um, in whatever environment that they're in um, to ensure that our, our uh, spaces are uh, inclusive and universally designed for students of all abilities right that we're not um, segregating kids depending on their either physical or behavioral or um, cognitive abilities, but really allowing for kind of a seamless transition and, and um, access to all elements, um, you know, and wanting to really integrate well um, elective classes, special education classes, core classes, uh, and then thinking about kind of what, what is physically, whether it's around um, you know, display or uh, decor, artwork, literature, 
um, and then the the events that happen within schools um, to to um, have your your Black Indigenous people of color, your BIPOC um, students, uh, educators, community feel um, represented. Right. We heard a lot about that from students, especially. Um, and then also to think about kind of where does that kind of equity belong in, in sports and extracurricular activities, right? And kind of thinking about um, what does it mean to provide resources and especially as we think about the physical resources, um, you know, where, where, do you, where do you get your biggest bang for your buck? Any questions about this one? Okay, um, the next one uh, is gonna be no surprise, especially for those of us that have endured the last almost two and a half years of this pandemic, right? We, if anything COVID has taught us as if we didn't know it well enough before is just the need to support kids, social, emotional health and well-being, right? That the, um, now more than ever, um, needing a space for students to, to truly um, exercise this muscle and to think about places of respite, um, what we call wellness rooms or self-regulation spaces, uh, a recognition that there are a bunch of different learning styles, personality types. Um, you know, the the example I gave about extroverts and introverts, but um, you know, this it it used to be that social emotional health and well-being were talked about relative to SPED kids, kids in special education exclusively. And what we've come to know is that this is actually across the board for adults and students in the building, right? And so thinking about ways of supporting that, providing sensory supports a culture in a building and spaces where um, everyone is allowed to kind of grow and thrive, um, creating that culture of care across the district and in our schools, um, offering, you know, the, having folks even on the call, right? Offering mental health supports for students, parents, and, and educators, um, and, and doing that skill building to be able to allow you to do that. Um, building capacity and space for counselors, um, additional resources that um, have been coming to school districts over the course of the last few years um, to uh, connect with kids. We know um, just nationally, but especially here in Oregon, the ratio of a student load to a counselor is ridiculous, right? And so how do you provide additional supports for kids so that way um, you're able to deal with kids not just in crisis, but um, preventing them from getting into crisis in the first place, right? Uh, and then the last one around kind of, you know, how do you, how do you balance the need for, um, you know, maintenance and cleanability and durability with the fact that kids just sometimes need access to healthy snacks during much longer periods than, you know, the 20 minutes they're given to eat their food during a lunch period, if we're being generous in, in some cases. And so um, wanting to ensure that you have the resources, not just to do that during a school day, but quite frankly, um, for communities in which um, coming to school and getting food is maybe the only food that kids have access to, how do you ensure that you've got the resources um, to support that as well? Any questions on this one? Um, we talk about, and they talk to us about creating spaces that are um, conducive to a positive educational experience, right? Um, so there are often places in schools where um, learning is happening in spaces that you have to create, right? Um, this is often true for spaces that weren't considered when they were originally built. So you're having to kind of hodgepodge spaces, having to re repurpose spaces. Um, I can tell you, I have seen every piece of a building become an office or a counseling space, um, every closet, right, that you want to try and create. But then also thinking about what are the furnishings that go in that and how do you create spaces with access to natural light, access to views, access to the outdoors, um, and create a way um, that starts to feel, um, yeah, that, that just starts to make us feel better about where we are, which can then lead, studies have shown, um, leads to um, greater educational outcomes. Uh, also talking about, it's not just about what's happening inside the buildings, right? But there are outdoor improvements that support wellness, recreation, socialization, and learning, right? So the ability to um, 
uh, fairly easily take kids outside. Um, while we know that it does rain here a lot, it doesn't rain all the time. And, and even with that, right, it does rain. So what, how do we um, support this even in Oregon, right, where you, where you have inclement weather, but you, you want to ensure that you still have access to fields, you want to ensure that you can still get outside when it's raining, but not super cold to do science inquiry or, or just to give kids um, an opportunity, a break to get outside. Um, and, and that the transition between interior and exterior spaces doesn't have to be um, so stark, right? That there, that there is a greater desire to increase those connections and bring the outside in and the inside out. Um, there was a note specifically from a lot of the folks that we talked to around the high school that the outdoor spaces there are not perceived as, espe as especially inviting or welcoming, right? And so how can we um, improve those um, and, and creating places for um, folks to congregate, to, to learn, to, to gather, um, thinking about playground areas. So this is one that um, was, was noted to us across the board as a need for number one, kind of um, inclusivity, but then also um, a little bit more natural, right? So that not everything has to be a big plastic um, uh, tube that you slide down. And then wanting to, to be sure that kids have an opportunity to, to garden and um, do some um, inquiry outside. <coughs> As you can imagine, we heard a lot from students about um, give us places where we can own them. You know, oftentimes we ask students where are spaces that you own and they say the bathrooms and the lockers, right? Everything else belongs to somebody else. It's a teacher's classroom, a librarian's library and a principal's office. But where's the place for us as students, right? And so um, a strong desire, especially as we work towards kind of um, this, this bridging of both our synchronous and asynchronous worlds of kind of wanting students to build some autonomy, some, some agency and, and ability to regulate. What are the kinds of spaces that we can create for kids um, to, 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 to learn those social skills and to learn um, kind of the, um, especially as they matriculate through school, like to be given more um, responsibility, more flexibility, while still being within sight and sound, right? It's that balance between um, kind of supervision and surveillance and agency. And so how do you create spaces like that that allow students to, um, to learn themselves, but then also to kind of build strong relationships, which we know is kind of a critical piece of how we learn and how we grow, um, but not just for students, right? So Certainly you want to foster authentic relationships between students, but also between students and teacher and between teachers and teachers and administrator, right? The, the idea of in order to build a culture of care, you have to foster those authentic relationships across everybody in a school system, right? Um, talk a lot about, uh, there was a lot of talk from students about um, personalization of space and creating space that feels like their own right, through the creative displays, um, you know, this also then has implications for some of that representation and thinking about that and, um, and allowing for flexibility for kids to maybe have a little bit of autonomy about where they sit, how they sit, um, and how they define comfort. The need to kind of balance safety and security with welcoming features. I mean, I feel like we can't go a month without um, being um, reminded why we need to think about safety and security. You know, Jennifer often talks about this is both her biggest fear and her biggest sense of responsibility, right? As the sort of custodial re um, responsibility she, she carries to keep everyone in her building, students, staff, um, safe, right? And, and secure. And so how do we do that in a way that um, that ensures that should worst case scenarios happen, you are able to keep everyone as safe as possible, knowing that nothing is foolproof, but certainly what are pieces that you can build in that can allow for that level of, of security. But to do that in a way that doesn't feel um, like a corporal state for like a better term, right? To do it in a way that is institutional, to do that in a way that still provides for uh, a good balance between that. I mean, in the best sense, all of those safety and security features should be there and they should be able to be deployed at the drop of a hat, but should be somewhat invisible, right? So that way you are able to then really say, okay, 
uh, we want you, you are here, you are welcome here. Um, you know, an understanding that, um, that for different cultures and for different, for di people with different lived experiences, safety can mean very different things, right? Um, security can mean very different things. Um, I don't think there is a single school in America that enjoys their drop off and pick up experience, right? That is a common complaint we hear everywhere, but especially uh, Independence Elementary School. Um, so thinking about, you know, ways that, that that often has safety and security implications and also welcoming uh, or lack thereof. Um, signage, wayfinding, all of that, um, arrival experiences, you know, this idea of we heard pretty clearly from families that when you're greeted by a locked door, that doesn't necessarily feel welcome, especially if you're coming to a building maybe without an ability to speak the language or some um, past experiences with school that wasn't that weren't too um, too positive. Right. And so, again, how do you create that balance? We understand why it's there, but are there alternatives and how do we look at those? We're almost there, right, Lisa? Yeah. Tell me. Okay. Um, so ensuring that schools are community centered with uh, family supports, right? That the other thing that COVID has taught us, again, as if we didn't know it going into this, that schools are this the heart of our community, right? We we saw when schools were closed, uh, the, the gap that that exposed in terms of um, food security, in terms of um, quite frankly, recognition of, of things that were happening in our families that, um, that we don't want happening to our families. And so how do we provide spaces and opportunities for additional supports for not just immigrant families, but just welcoming spaces for kids um, and families in general? Um, you know, to receive services um, and and things that um, that you know kind of expand the sort of the the dignity of um, bringing your kids to school, right? So whether it's an access to a community kitchen or uh, a food pantry or a clothes closet, <clears throat> the having laundry facilities, all of those things that can um, make a family's experience with school um, much more positive. Um, and then also supporting intergen intergenerational connections, right? So welcoming grandparents in, um, to especially to elementary schools, but, uh, you know, thinking about sort of the benefits to, to both sides of that, right? Not just to youth, but also um, to the older adults in your community. And yeah, just a, that you feel good coming into school, right? That they are a place of warmth and that you, you've arrived at a safe and the right place. So how do you ensure that schools um, create those opportunities. And that that kids primarily, but even we, we talk about learners in a building, and that to me is as much the adults as it is the kids, but that you inspire, um, inspire learning, right? That you spark initiative, creativity, um, that we should have that uh, sort of uh, sterile environments don't necessarily allow for this, right? So wanting robust, colorful spaces, um, that aren't overly institutional, but that also don't look like a circus, right? Um, create that sense of whimsy, that sense of why is that there? And, you know, how could I use that and, and using that and using the building as a teaching tool to a certain extent to, to inspire creativity um, and uh, make sure that they don't feel architecturally marginalized. That's something that we work very hard to ensure um, that we think about that. What are the messages that you're putting in your building? Um, and that uh, that these are these should be sources of pride and community, um, kind of a beacon for your community, and wanting to ensure that um, that you're able to provide that. Sweet Jiminy Christmas! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <Not a concept. laughs> yeah. Any questions based on anything you heard? Any pushback or any did it um, did anything spark any thoughts for you? This this is cease. I think um, thinking back, looking forward, I appreciate <clears throat> that you can kind of tell where a lot of the comments come from the high school and knowing that <clears throat> that high school is ob <laughs> obviously had more attention and more recently than our other buildings. Um, I, I, I'm interested because I see a lot of the features they want. I get that the plants are dead in the courtyard, but talking about sort of the places that they have their own space and their agency, 
I thought that was a pretty amazing design of that high school that it has the little, I, I call them the lobbies or the commons, or uh -huh. right? Yeah, the little common spaces uh -huh. seemed really forward thinking at the time. So I'm kind of interested that the students there don't think they have spaces like that. So I, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of these comments weren't just about the high school. So I'll start there, right? That that the the efforts and the um, the design that went into some of those spaces hasn't sort of matriculated down, right? Made it to all your facilities. But even in some of those spaces, sometimes it's about what we heard from, from students and families was it, sometimes it's about furniture. Sometimes it's about kind of policies and procedures about the use of space, not necessarily just that it isn't there, but maybe in its configuration, it's not working necessarily the, 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 in a most conducive way to support that. If that makes sense. Yep. So those are certainly things we'll want to poke at. Um, but yeah, I think there was an incredible investment made there that that has reaped rewards. And so um, you want to ensure that they're continuing to meet the needs. And so how can you do that? Some of that may not be building related at all, right? Like actual, it might be more policy and procedure. Thanks. Anybody else? Anything else this for, for you? Okay. So um, how are you guys doing? Does anyone need a bio break? You guys doing good? Okay. Um, if, if anybody does need a bio break, you know, just step away for a few moments and then come back and join us. Um, this is the last time I'm going to spiel at you for a long period of time or a relatively long period of time, but we want to, um, we want to think a little bit about kind of who are these next generation learners that we're, we're talking about, right? Um, take a moment to just, uh, what I say, sort of suspend certainty, stop um, for a moment thinking about the way school was when we were in school or how it is even today, and think about really what are the needs of, um, of students moving forward in the future, and how can that then shape what we um, want to create in terms of experiences, in terms of opportunities, in terms of spaces um, for students moving forward. So we often talk about um, that we are we are preparing students for jobs that don't exist yet using technologies that haven't invented haven't been invented to solve problems that we don't even know are problems yet, right? So there is this um, kind of uh, uh, unknown nature to our future that we are trying to prepare um, everyone in our society, but to really be problem solvers for things that we just we don't even know. We know some problems that exist. But how do we create future thinkers, future leaders that can kind of carry us forward? And so what are those kind of core characteristics of we are reaching the end of this generation, which is called Generation Z? Um, after this, they say that this is the last generation only because then the changes will be so small and so quick that there'll be micro generations kind of moving forward. Um, but kind of what are the core characteristics of the kids that are in your schools today? So um, it, this will be the last predominantly white generation, right? Diversity is kind of their norm. Um, thinking about not just here in Oregon, but in the world that they see, um, uh, multiculturalism, um, folks of uh, different cultures, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, languages um, are, are quickly going to become the majority, um, not the minority, uh, at least in numbers, maybe not in terms of identity, but um, that this is a reality um, that, that students are, are aware of and kind of moving towards. That, uh, I mean, anybody that has a, a young kid, especially in their lives, um, is, is, you know, aware of just kind of the, the ubiquitous nature of technology, right? Thinking about not only are they digitally, digitally digital natives, easier for me to say, um, but that also the ability to navigate that technology quickly um, is, um, it feels like it's almost taught in the womb now, right? I mean, I, I've got a two-year-old nephew who can run circles around me in terms of how he works the iPad, right? And kind of what I do every day. But especially, you know, during the pandemic, right? That there was a, a kind of unprecedented um, increase in the use of technology. And, uh, and so just having access to a smartphone, something that allows them to, at their fingertips, have access to information, right? And so what does that mean? 
if they don't need a teacher necessarily to tell them what two plus two is because they have a device that can do that, then what are the implications for teaching and learning, right? If that aspect of it isn't always there. Right, they're pragmatic, right? So thinking about um, the, the pressures that, uh, that Generation Z has been under in terms of financial, in terms of kind of the pandemic, honestly, um, thinking about ways that, that they're, um, they have been forced to kind of reckon with uh, an uncertain economic reality. Um, and so thinking about uh, ways in which that they, they see the reality of that. And so they're, they're very much wanting to, um, to create that economic sustainability and, and um, stability for themselves and for their families. Uh, I, we talked about this a little bit, but we are seeing just alarming rates of mental health challenges in students. Um, you know, it is more likely, uh, or 27 percent are more likely than other generations to to report mental health. Their mental health is, um, quite frankly, just fair or poor. Right? The chronic Karina? stress. Yes, Karina, I have a wondering on this statistic. Yeah. Um, is this also because, or maybe because there's a bigger awareness of mental health going on because we've done so hard to work at like just normalizing that everyone has mental health and so they're more aware of it? Or is it really just because of these things that you're talking about? I think it's probably, to be, to be fair, Emily, a combination of both, right? I mean, I certainly think there willingness to to name and to say it out loud is what you're refer, referring to right that we have societally tried and certainly in schools tried to do um, a lot to destigmatize access to mental health and just mental health challenges and so I certainly think the reporting of that is higher um, the occurrence of that however I don't think really has is about that destigmatization I think it really is a combination of um, of uh, things that are happening societally. I mean, I think we, even as adults, all feel this additional stress and burden, right? So I think it's Thank probably you. a combination of both, Emily, honestly. Next. So, um, you know, talking about what we hear reported or what, what um, we learn about this generation is that they're really kind of um, a, a variety of social issues that are important to them, right? Um, folks that really want to, in this generation, be engaged civically, be thinking about how they can contribute um, to their community. Um, education is important uh, and different ways of getting access to different forms of education is important. I talked already about kind of that economic secu um, security, healthcare, both physical, mental, dental, uh, visual, all of those. Um, uh, mental health, we talked about racial equity and the environment, right? These are kind of the top items that are reported um, by, uh, by this generation. <coughs> so when we talk about kind of civic engagement, again, um, I, I think students are um, leveraging social media, especially um, toward, to, towards activism, towards digital activism, sometimes not necessarily in the most positive ways. Um, so there is quite frankly, some um, digital literacy that still has to happen, but um, students really think that their voices have power, right? That they aren't just consumers of information, but they're also producers of information. Um, certainly um, we know that, that our youth has access to at least one major social media platform, oftentimes many simultaneously. Um, the launch of Be Real in the last uh, probably two to three months um, is further evidence of that, right? That it feels like every time we turn around, there's yet another um, social media platform. And, you know, maybe to get to a point you were talking about earlier, um, uh, Emily, you know, this and potentially the link to the mental health crisis aren't necessarily um, not connected, right? that this, this may actually be a contributor to that. And so, um, but it's also uh, the hard reality of our times. I don't think this is going away anytime soon. And so how do we um, teach kids to, to work within this environment? Speaking of the environment, you know, 87%, almost 90% of Generation Z is worried about the environment, um, worried about, um, and wanting to impact change in a positive way. You know, they, they see sort of the climate crisis um, as something that they want to tend to. And so um, wanting to be kind of conscious of that. 
And we have some of our best environmental stewards, quite frankly, in our schools today that are holding us accountable, keeping us accountable. And so how do we, um, how do we leverage that? Um, you know, I, I think this generation, um, at least statistically, is saying that they are the least likely to drop out of high school and the most likely to, to pursue further education, um, not necessarily college, but just kind of further skills, but also recognition that learning is different, right? Learning is happening um, online, it's happening at all times, it's on demand much more so um, than having to go someplace to get it. But then what does that look like in terms of those that are doing the guiding, right? Like I said, if if I no longer, I always um, make the, the mention that I think it was almost five years ago now, um, PISA, which is the international organization that offers the, that does kind of the, the um, assessment of where different countries rank, right? Um, uh, when they start, did their assessment, um, I believe it was the first time they did it was in 2016. If you can Google the answer, they give you the answer in the question. And so then it becomes, now what do I do with that, right? And how does that change how we think about learning, right? If I'm not, if I don't need to have somebody teach me what two plus two is, which we still, there's, there's some of that for our younger learners, but if I can Google that, then what do I do with, okay, so what does this mean when I add something to something else, right? How do I transform that thinking? Um, you know, I think students also recognize the value of the dollar, right? So um, wanting a job that, that, um, that will allow them to support their family, support their future, and thinking about that kind of shaping their career. I will say, that this is very much an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, I can't tell you the number of kids in my life or that that I know that have started businesses that are, you know, forming Etsy shops or, um, you know, brewing their own curb, um, grinding their own coffee, selling their own coffee, whatever it is, but recognizing that this idea of kind of a corner lemonade stand that we had growing up um, it is not necessarily um, just what kids are doing and that businesses, quite frankly, are leveraging that, right? So there are a number of businesses that are having um, consultants as young as middle schoolers on their payroll because they recognize sort of the value of, of them to be able to kind of contribute to their bottom line as well. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think this is surprising um, that students just in general, I think probably this is true for all of us, but recognize that um, our mental health suffered over the last two, two and a half years. And, um, and we talked about that the social uh, media and this uh, sort of um, lack of socialization has augmented sort of feelings of, of feeling alone and isolated. And so how do we combat that? Uh, I think there's a, a, a growing recognition that there, there is an equity um, in our society, in our, in our country, um, and that the communities are an understanding um, that communities of color, communities um, with identities in the margin, um, perhaps have a, a greater, um, bear a greater burden there. And so thinking about um, wanting to, to understand that, um, you know, according to the, the research by the Casey Foundation, 88% of um, those polled do believe that there is a difference um, from a racial perspective of how, um, how some folks in our society are treated. And so um, where, do, where do you kind of carry that forward? And so, you know, thinking about uh, the, the duality of this recognition that um, people feel under pressure or, you know, that sense of, um, of um, stress, but also an overwhelming belief that uh, an optimism that comes from the belief that this will be the generation that changes the world, right? Um, any of you that are in schools certainly hold this hope to be true, right? Because you see what's happening in your schools every day and you know these kids are gonna go out there and just kill it and save us from ourselves, quite frankly. Um, so there's kind of that duality that we're dealing with. And then we'll get to kind of what are the core competencies um, both needed and um, uh, that we're trying to develop in our schools, right? So uh, cognitive competency, right? So a recognition that um, kind of this, this um, ecosystem of, 
of abilities around critical thinking, um, active listening, creativity, problem solving, innovation, and digital literacy uh, are important to, to as important to kind of the, the next one, yeah, that you have to take those cognitive skills and you have to think about then what are the interpersonal skills and competencies that you wanna, that you wanna um, you know, empower your kids. So you want your kids to be future leaders, to know how to collaborate. There isn't probably a job in the world today where collaboration is an incredibly important. Um, and, and the need for empathy and to be able to kind of understand your role and how it's impacting others and kind of what others are bringing to the table thinking about how to resolve conflict um, interpersonally at their job, in their lives, um, and then um, how, to, how to sort of um, present themselves and, um, and also um, regulate themselves, right? Self-regulation. And then kind of thinking about the intrapersonal skills, right? Um, the, the need to think about kind of where we are in our community, what kind of citizen do I wanna be? Um, how do I adjust to adaptability? How flexible am I? Um, what this idea that learning stops, you know, even as you after you finish college um, or what, wherever the end of your um, career or your learning path is, we are still learning every day and adapting, right? Um, and understanding that there's a cultural competency that comes with that from an interpersonal perspective. the impacts of the pandemic, right? Um, the, the first thing that we learned is that this kind of one size fits all schooling is a thing of the past, right? So um, as we reopen schools, but certainly um, as we continue to kind of move forward and as you're thinking about then what kind of experiences and what kind of facilities do you want to support your learners? How can we think about that in a way where we're creating a variety of opportunities for a much wider band of learners, introverts, extroverts, fast processors, reflective thinkers, and how can our spaces and our, um, our practices allow for, for that moving forward? And thinking about, yeah, how do, you, how do you combine competence, autonomy, and make it relatable for folks um, in a way that is gonna make somebody, if, if our goal is to create lifelong learners, you have to be intrinsically motivated to learn. Can't be something that somebody's forcing at you. And so how do you combine these three in order to do that? All right. You did. <laughs> I did. Anybody have questions before we go to this, um, Elisa? Go back maybe. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Anybody have questions before? Like anything? I'm, I'm curious. I want to hear from folks about um, some wonderings that you had or anything that you kind of go, huh, that's not really kind of the jiving with the experience that I'm seeing in district. Because while we know that this is kind of what the research that's out there about this generation as a whole, there are certainly exceptions to the rule, right? Isabel, I'm, I'm not to call you out, but I'm going to call you out uh, because I know that this is an area, you know, a lot of what, what we heard today, uh, you're experiencing in the work that you do. So I want to I want to invite you to to share any experiences there um, and see where that is. Did you say Isabel? I did. OK, <laughs> just making sure. Um, well, I did. not uh, there was a, quite a few things that stood out to me, honestly. Um, for me, space, it's big and um, helping kids feel welcome, families feel welcome. And that's definitely something, especially for me that I bounce around throughout the district. It's pretty rough, I will mm -hmm. say. Um, so that really stood out to me. Um, I believe a student or maybe a parent made a comment or maybe it was a staff member, sorry, um, about that, just that specific, um, just you know, space for kids um, to be able to have mental health appointments and what that looks like and what that feels like and just your vision when you go into a, um, the building. And um, there's actually, I've been making notes of other things, but um, just even uh, kid going to the door and um, waiting quite a bit of time to be let in and, you know, just 
all those things, especially when it's cold outside. Um, there's just, uh, for me, like, again, space and how that feels for kids and what that looks like. It's really big and it's really awkward. I have been in closet size spaces um, seeing kids and that does not feel very good. Um, not for myself and not for the kid. Um, it feels very unwelcoming. And, um, and then, or when I'm having to move and like people have a full desk of things and it's just, it's just not ideal for anybody's mental health, sure. to be honest. Yeah. But um, right. sorry, yeah. that's what I have right now. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else have struck by anything? Have any wonderings? Yeah, Andrew. I mean, I just heard a, it was a lot. So it's a lot to process. I'd love to get the PowerPoint email to us so we can read over it. That would be great for me. Um, but I think the, the big bullet points that stuck out to me was more hands-on, more life skills, more real life experiences. And, and then your last statement, um, intrinsically motivated. I mean, that's, that's a big ask. I'm just, I'm just curious what the plan is for that um, <laughs> we have that one solved <laughs> but, but yeah um, but yeah i i mean i i love the direction and i'm i'm really excited to see how this moves forward so i awesome. yeah Great. anybody else maybe jen this might be a good opportunity for you to just kind of lend the i mean you we've talked about all of this stuff but just kind of lend your perspective on how this relates to, to the district and the work you're doing um, already in the district. Yeah, I just was, um, as you were talking, I, and again, we're gonna get into this with our community this spring as we, as I, uh, with our superintendent chats, uh, talked with youth and I'm gonna say K-12, because uh, I did go into elementaries and even talk to fourth and fifth graders, um, sixth graders, very diverse groups from, as you shared, uh, as you all did two metric groups, but to FFA to um, multiple groups in the middle school and even a couple of our equity teams that we have at the elementaries uh, of the groups that of kids. Uh, a lot of the Z is what they're saying and the community is gonna get to uh, see that a, a little bit more robustly even as we start and uh, we, or we look at our strategic plan, are we still on the same path? and I think some of the things that we have felt in the last two years and as we come out of and um, as hard as this is to say, talking to kids, um, some positive things, but there are things that are pretty similar in our school district and, and acknowledging that and, and then working with um, our staff, our community and, and how we continue to uh, uh, both listen to their voices because again, not always, again, for you, growing and so we have to, to balance that out but um, we have some very, very um, clear expectations that they have uh, for us is how I'll phrase it and what their education should be and uh, I think it's going to be at times hard for adults because of you know kids say to me all the time Dr. Kavissa probably like want and I acknowledge that and know that we have to uh, think differently to allow the future to look and be different so it's just going to be uh, I'm excited for this group um, because again, I think it is, um, some of the things that I'm hearing from our students and staff and community and how do we how do we balance this because uh, I will our buildings need some uh, tender loving care and you all start to see that as we share assessments. Um, again, Emily stuck one in there, but as we go through that, um, we need to we need to take some steps uh, as we move forward. Yeah, your um, audio. I, I thought it was just me, but then I got confirmation that for whatever reason you sounded a little bit like a robot. You got some static, so um, I, I think we heard most people got kind of the gist of what you were saying, but it was definitely through some static there. So sorry about that. Yep, I'm gonna turn off my video. Oh, now you're fine. Now you're good. It tends to, tends to be the video. <laughs> it tends to be the video. Okay, well, um, good so far, but I, I think we got the gist of what you were saying. At least certainly I did. Anybody else? 
I'm interested to hear maybe from um, from Byron or, or um, Don from a board's perspective. Um, I'll say? share really quick, oh, ahead, even Kim. though even though I am not Byron or Don, this is Kim Seidel. <laughs> yeah, um, Kim. So I just one of the things that I think about when we're working on this process is um, students experiencing disabilities and mm -hmm. um, being really thoughtful about how we can make sure that we are creating spaces for those students that include them and that accommodate and that make it so it's not an afterthought. I want to make sure that I tried to win that billion dollars so that I could build a state of the art school and um, have these big dreams about beautiful pods that can support all kids and that kind of thing. But I do want to make sure that that's something that's really at the forefront of our mind is, um, you know, we don't want to look at making these spaces wonderful and beautiful and then go, oh yeah, we need to make sure that we have, you know, a place for equipment for students who need sure. special equipment and that kind of thing. So that's yeah. that's my big push. Thanks. And I, I just realized um, we're actually behind schedule. So I want to move us to group work, but don't, if Byron or, or Don, you had some quick thoughts that you want to share. Otherwise um, we can share them in small groups. I guess I can be fairly quick. Um, I guess one of the things that struck me in, in trying to absorb this, and I agree with Andrea, there was a lot of material here to absorb, so I'm not going to claim that I've absorbed it all. Uh, but one of the things that struck me was just how flexible things need to be. As I was watching pictures of Independence Elementary School, and I'm looking now at a picture of the high school and, and looking at how much different that is over a time period, and thinking about the future and that the kids are going to learn different tomorrow than they learn yeah. today and are already doing that. The need to have spaces that can be reconfigured easily is going to be paramount as we move forward because we can't, you can't build a bunch of square rooms with blackboards on one side and expect that that's going to work for uh, even this generation, much less the, the ones that are coming in the future. So uh, I think creativity and uh, new ways of looking at things uh, are going to be key as, as we uh, make plans for even four or five years out, much less 10 years out. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Tom. All right. So um, now what we want to do is we want to break you up. We'll break you up into um, some uh, some smaller groups. So um, Elisa is going to put the link um, to the mural board and uh, Elisa, myself and um, Allison will be in those groups. So we will be there taking notes. So don't feel um, please don't let the technology come um, become a burden. We we can just have a conversation and we can be the ones taking notes in there. But what we really want to hear from you all in those small groups is um, again, I'm going to invite you to, for a moment, not think about the facility, because that'll be our next step. But just based on everything you heard, based on what you know, what educational programs, what opportunities, what experiences um, are, are needed to really support um, the development of all of your school district students, particularly, um, you know, Kim, I, I definitely appreciate what you were saying about um, any any student, um, those that are traditionally underserved, right? So how how can we best support every student um, in the Central School District and what opportunities, um, experiences do we want for them? So with that, um, we're gonna stop sharing. Um, I believe Elise is gonna put us into small groups. Yes, one second. Um, uh, don't forget Elisa and um, Allison to hit record in your group. Um, yes. And so we will we'll have three rooms and um, for Emily, 20 minutes. um as a co-host, I wasn't able to place you in a room, but feel free to just hop in whatever room you'd like after we we go there. Okay, right, we'll do this for 20 minutes and then come out and share back with each other. Okay. So we'll and see then, you in uh, your small groups. Just so you guys, uh, Karina and Allison, so um when you're logging your notes on the mural board, um, Karina, you are room one and Allison, you're room two. Okay. Room three. Okay. I got it. Is that go? <laughs> Okay. 
Hello, everyone. Well, that worked. That's good. And it looks like it's recording too. Give me one second to put up the mirror board. And was everyone able to open that link? Okay, so you can um, also see it on your personal screen. Sometimes that's easier. But um, I can also share my screen. Um, and the purpose of it would be just to kind of, you know, give you guys a chance to um, to actually even add stickies as we talk, um, or if you, well, as you talk out loud, I'm going to add stickies. So you have two opportunities. Um, okay, let me share my screen. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so we have uh, the question that's been um, posed to everybody at the top there. So what educational programs, opportunities, and experiences are needed to support the needs of all central school district students, particularly those from traditionally underserved communities? So hearing all the information that was presented in this session, what are your thoughts? What are the types of um, experiences that you feel are important to provide for your students? Um, thinking about, you know, what what the facilities can support as well, but it is a higher level kind of, you know, conversation at this point. I guess my first question is, do the underserved communities know all the opportunities that are already available to them? Do you have programs in particular that you had in mind for that or um or have you heard that uh i mean i'm pretty involved in programming in the community and i feel like that is one of the biggest barriers is getting the information out to families that the programs actually exist because i feel like there's a lot going on in the community already and the numbers aren't there but then people are asking for it and we're already trying to provide it that's a good point. Along those same lines, I, I remember um, one of the things that was brought up was that students feel like they're not asked for their opinion on things that we offer, but a lot of our, especially our CT programs are specifically geared because students have asked for them. And so I don't know if some students just aren't aware of how to submit their ideas and opinions like maybe they missed that survey email or something like that and so i don't know um the communication aspect i would say also goes directly to families and their interests well and along those lines is it something that the kids asked for that we provided but the information isn't being seen by the parents and it's something that the parent has to sign them up for so mm -hmm. And what, sorry, I, I missed the first part because I was having audio issues, but um, I wanted to add to what um, Andrew was saying, um, too, is that what I heard a lot from parents, um, and I've had a couple uh, good sized parent meetings that um, we've talked about different topics, but primarily mental health, but um, some of these things came up and is that a lot of the information is sent in ways that they don't they don't receive they you know if they don't know about apps certain apps that schools use or um the way it's done um it's like either english is on top and then spanish on the bottom and then a lot of people overlook that um uh, <clears throat> there's just an or we're not targeting that population so um say for example um we have an event and it's like oh it's going to be just to throw out an example at the Cipri, which is great. I love the Cipri. I think it's fantastic. I want to go there. Um, but that's not everybody's cup of tea either. So um, you know, especially I'm thinking from the population that I primarily work with, which is Spanish speaking um, Latino families here in our community, they are not going there. Mm -hmm. So um, they're right there, you're excluding a big chunk of our community. So that's two cents on that i guess that brings up i mean what is that a poll we can do what is the best way to reach you because it's going out on facebook it's going out on peach jar it's going out to your personal email it's going out in spanish it's going out in english like how do we get them the information <laughs> that's really yeah that's a really good question and um i think that um, again a lot of the times 
um, technology is, you know, it's a barrier, which is interesting to think because most of us have a computer with us, right, at all times um, in our phones. But, and I've been surprised myself where I'm like, oh yeah, you can email me this or that. And I just make assumptions and it's like, ah, I have an email, but I don't use it and I don't even know how to check it. So then I'm spending time, you know, showing them how that works. But so just because somebody has a phone doesn't mean that they're accessing, you know, email apps, you know, things like that. So we kind of have to step way back and see, you know, okay, how can we help you kind of with that literacy, that technology literacy. So I spend time showing people how to use Zoom so they can get to their doctor's appointments because a lot of them are being done that way, you know, et cetera. So um, it's, um, I think a lot of times, again, like you're saying, we send them out on all these forms because, you know, because we assume like, well, you know, this way and this way and this way, but that doesn't mean that they know how to access that even on their phone. So So is that a way we reach the underserved communities by bringing in an adult course for the Latino population or the underserved population to teach them how to access the materials they need to be a part of the program? I think that would be a fantastic idea. And we did do a little bit of that during the adult ESL classes um, or ELL, whatever the new acronym is always changing, it seems like. Um, And we did do a little bit of that because we realized, oh, wait, if we have to do these plans online, most of you don't know how to access Zoom. So we had to spend quite a bit of time teaching them how to do that and practicing. And, you know, but even that after they left, it's like, uh, so yes, I do think we need to have some type of, you know, literacy night for parents to learn just the basics of how does Remind app work? How does, you know, how do we access our email and how do you email back? And what do you, I mean, again, very basics that I think many of us make assumptions in okay. myself included. The um, email from the district, it could be multiple flyers from outside organizations advertising programs in your community. <laughs> like, right, right. We need to be cognizant though of comfortability and familiarity for our families because sometimes it's a phone call from the school because that's what they're most comfortable with or familiar with. And so that is another avenue to reach, but we do have to take all of that into consideration. And I'm sure there are many that are willing to learn um, new new ways and technology, but we also need to make sure that we continue to to, um, continue some of the ways that we communicate just because again, that comfortability and familiarity. Do you mean kind of direct interpersonal communication like when they're on site? Yes, and I'm, as we're talking about, you know, like the Cipri or what have you, um, we need to find those comfortable, familiar places that our families do want to convene and um, they do want to have a comfortable space for that learning. Um, real quick housekeeping item, Emily, uh, Karina just sent me a text and asked um, if you could um, please grant um, both her and Allison permission to record. You might have to make them co-hosts also. That's what um, I've just done. That's oh, why perfect. I would. No yep. worries. Okay, good. Thank yeah. you. I might yeah. be behind on my texts. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, let's go on. But, um, Byron, what are your thoughts? I'm I'm really trying to absorb a lot of this right now, um, and what I'm trying to trying to balance is, you know, we are we are entrusted with with, um, and I'll call them sacred resources from our community to make sure that. Uh, that there's a, a good return on, on the investment that everybody makes into these schools. And so I hear quite a bit about, you know, making people comfortable and welcoming and this, and all that is very important, but I haven't heard, at least to my recollection yet, as far as how all of this stuff ties into the performance of the students, mm-hmm. how, 
you know, I think I think it's important to make sure that we are sensitive, uh, but we also need to prepare our, our kids with a sense of resiliency and a sense of of a, a way to be able to to function, you know, post high school and you know once they once they get out of out of their their parents' house. And so I'm really I'm really trying to juggle all these things in my mind. So I'm trying to do a lot of listening right now mm -hmm. uh, and, and balancing that because all of these points that you're all making are very, very valid. It's, it's how do you reach every family? How do you do that on their terms? How do you meet them where they're at? Um, but at the same time, they also have to be invested in this process. There's, there's accountability from all sides for kids and parents. If they want their kids to succeed, and if they want their kids, you know, maybe to be in a better place than they were, which is, I think, a lot of parents want, is what are what are they willing to to put into the process here? And so, um, there's just, <laughs> and I'm sort of doing this stream of consciousness thing right no, now. But uh, I mean, I think that's great. We 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 run two, 300 kids every six weeks in sports, and I can barely get five parents to step up and coach. So. I mean, I see, I see that. I feel like people do want to just put their kid in something and not be invested in it and have you deal with it. So I definitely understand that yeah. side of things. But we do, but there are parents who, who genuinely don't know or there are barriers for yes. that information. Yes. So it's how do you discern between where to put your resources? Um, because they are limited, they are limited, so. Well, some of these barriers that we're talking about now, just in communication and um, distribution of information and, and how our families are actually receiving and digesting that information, if we can figure out what those barriers are and address them, then it will be a lot easier to communicate because I don't believe that any of our parents like don't want their kids to, to have a better life than they do. and. And our kids are clearly worried a little bit about whether or not they will because of their um, the data that shows that they have a little bit maybe more financial insecurity than um, other generations before them. Um, so I, I think that I think it's possible. I think it's possible to get them more involved. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, Byron, but I think it's possible. And I would love to figure that out because I feel like people do hold back because they think they can't afford it or this and that. And I know speaking as my organization, like we don't turn anyone away. There's always a scholarship or a way. So is that, is that communicated? And I mean, I don't know the first thing about soccer, Andrea, I could never volunteer to be a soccer coach ever in a million years. So I don't know if it's just like we do more than soccer. <laughs> but if, but if no one else does, and you're willing to do it, then, you know, that's, that's where it, that's the thing. Yeah. And we I mean, can, that's, that's a whole nother topic. We can talk. Yeah. About you can I, email I do, me. I'll give you resources. I, I do think <laughs> though, that even, even more fundamentally, you know, what educational programs, opportunities, experience are needed to support the needs of central school districts. The, the question for the board in my mind is what are we trying to do? I mean, we need, we need to make sure that we, have a as concrete as an idea as we can as to what we're trying to create here and make sure that everything we do is headed towards that goal because I think this COVID was a watershed moment and you know like it said earlier in the slide you know we can't we can't do we can't keep the status quo and expect to be have our kids prepared for what's ahead but it's awfully hard to fix an airplane while it's screaming through the air and that's kind of what we're doing here um, and so we got to make sure that the the solutions that we implement as a board and as community and stakeholders etc don't reinforce don't make us further stuck and entrenched into the old ways of doing things so just being mindful that we got to be flexible. 
Related to that, and this is, it's, it, it kind of occurred to me, it's related to a lot of what people are talking about here, you know, in terms of um, what Byron was saying, and also, you know, the barriers we're talking about. One thing that we've heard is that, you know, scheduling can be a big barrier, um, traditional school schedules, right, bell schedules um, for students and families, and specifically to the pandemic, right, like when schools were closed, a lot of students, um, got used to kind of doing that asynchronous learning thing and, you know, taking on after school jobs or out of school jobs um, and um, being active in the working world, kind of getting a taste of that. And then when schools reopened, it was like, okay, no, now you're going back to this like traditional school schedule. You're going to be here for these hours. And it felt a little bit like babysitting, right? And like they, they lost some autonomy there. And then with families, you know, we've heard sometimes, uh, you know, scheduling can be a barrier for parent involvement um, or um, and then with um, uh, students who are English language learners, oftentimes they have um, less access to elective classes because they have other classes that fill their, their schedules during the school day and they don't have room in their schedules um, than to take like electives that might be more engaging and inspiring, like, you know, expose them to the CTE opportunities that they're interested in. I don't know what if that. What do you guys think of that? I was thinking about that, and, and I'm not sure we can do that on our own. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that we, that we don't need to leverage more resources around us using, you know, corroborating with the Dallas School District and Salem-Kaiser School District to perhaps provide some of those opportunities that maybe we don't, and then we can provide the opportunities that they don't, perhaps, and being more able to pivot mm -hmm. and and collaborative not just within our school district but outside of our school district so uh, that recognizing would, that we can't be everything to everybody but we can that would also probably include some in transportation i was oh, sorry to say that as well i agree with you mm -hmm. because scheduling comes with parents time and if they're working and they can't get their kid there then what do you do? And I'm talking the younger kids. I feel like high school kids could walk or ride a bike, but. Um, I also wanted to add that I, I think all of this is very directly related to students. I know we're talking a lot about parents and parent engagement, but um, you know, parents are, play a huge role in the kids in our kids' lives and our students' lives. So I think that's really important. And the other thing that I, um, you know, like you, again, transportation, parents work late. But to add to all of this, though, I think a piece that sometimes um, maybe gets forgotten is that uh, maybe a parent is not engaging the way we think they should be engaging, but they're engaging it in other ways. Um, speaking from uh, the Latino culture, though, is, um, traditionally in Mexico, I went to Mexico, for, I went to Mexico um, schools for 15 years. So traditionally parents are not involved actually because they trust the teachers, they trust the community, they trust, and there's just a lot of, you know, whatever you say goes and you listen to the teacher and you do this and that, you know, so there is, it is a lot more hands off and they work late, they work weird are hours and, and that is past is tradition. So a lot of them carry that tradition here. So it's not that they don't care. It's not that they don't want to make the effort, but there's also other things. So I just wanted to make sure to add that little piece in there is that, you know, some parents really do care deeply um, and would like to, you know, but also assimilating to this culture, um, it is, a, you know, it is different. We, we do have, you know, different expectations and how do we communicate that to those parents, you know, how to kind of make that connection, how, you know, your involvement will help the, you know, the success of, you know, everybody. So I think that's just wanted to add that little piece. Thank you for that, Isabel. That's really important for, for us to understand. Absolutely. I mean, putting it on the kids just made me think that the, I know that the city of independence has been working with Portland state to, to build a bike path in the community so that it connect the kids to family friendly facilities, the sports park, which doesn't exist. So I don't know if there's anything in the plans to like collaborate with the city and the district to work on that. And, and Andrea, um, as you mentioned that, and I've talked with city 
um, officials just about independence. And we really need to think about what's developmentally appropriate because I'm not gonna send my kindergartner on their bike, you know, five blocks to independence. So we need to look at the age. I mean, it, sure, 12, 13, yes, the bike path is great, but I hear from parents all the time, kindergartners, first graders. So when you're talking five to nine or 10 year olds, they're not comfortable just sending their child to walk to school. It's always car drop off or pick up. And that's why the majority of my students are car drop off and car pickup because they're at that age level where, you know, families still want to um, monitor and make sure that their child gets to school safely and is picked up safely. Yes, and I absolutely agree with you. I'm just thinking right now, I have a 12 year old that I feel comfortable riding a bike places, but there's places I won't send her because there's not a safe path. So maybe just trying to get a little bit more access for the kids that are age appropriate. Like safe routes to school. Yeah, the older children, and that is a conversation that I've even wanted to have with Oregon Department of Education because they, they decide the, the mile and then transportation for more than a mile and all of that. But we do need to take into consideration um, children. And um, Isabel, just to extend on what you have said, I've had lots of experiences with families that have said, you as the educators are the experts here at the table. We trust you. We're going with pretty much like your decision or what have you. So we do need to definitely take that into consideration. Our um, cultural biases or, you know, how other uh, cultures and, and um, families from other culture, cultures perceive and, and function more so about decision making. Great. Thank you all. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, they are uh, going back to the main room, but this has been a great discussion. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and let's see, figure out how to do this. Okay, I'm going to close the room starting now. Get everybody. All right. Sorry, Elisa, I kept putting a big sticky in your face. Like I know. I, know. <laughs> I was like, because I couldn't, you weren't responding to text. I couldn't reach Emily. But we were having a we, good discussion. I just I know. Oh, I appreciate hard. it. I appreciate it. Well, you use the technology you have access to, is what I will say. Yeah, um, I think all we're right, all so, here, Karina. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so welcome back, everybody. Um, I know we probably could have done that for a lot longer, and I do apologize for for um, cutting us short. Um, Emily, or maybe uh, Lisa, since you can already share, would you mind sharing your screen and showing yeah. the, the mural board so we can do a quick um, wrap up? Yes. Um, so I'll start with what we talked about in our room, in, in room number one. Um, we started talking about just kind of the future of career, right? And and that we needed to um, to intertwine and, and create kind of equal value for both college and career um, and, and looking at what the, the opportunities are there and, and a recognition that this concept of, um, you know, Jennifer talks about how this is only her fourth job ever. I only have had three jobs actually that's in, in architecture. And so, that, but that's a rarity, right? That we need to prepare students to change careers regularly, that it's no longer a matter of how to pack your brain full for what you need to do for a single job, but how do you create and cultivate problem solvers that are able to have multiple jobs and thinking about what that looks like. Um, and, and that um, there's a need to do that across all of our students, right? That students with special needs, um, should not feel like an afterthought, right? That it should be a natural component of space for it to be a universal access, universal design, and to prepare students to kind of be adaptive. Um, and that there is, you know, we talked about this idea of a rising tide lifts all boats, this understanding that by creating spaces that are more um, sort of equitable and inclusive, that it benefits um, all learners, it benefits um, everyone in the building. And so thinking about that, um, 
uh, talked about kind of a, a you can do anything mentality, right? That um, that the need to um, empower women and girls to strive for careers and futures that are kind of outside of their traditional roles and, and um, the need for um, uh, allowing for folks to move from kind of interest to interest and kind of whether it is um, a career pathway, whether it is um, a multicultural competency, you know, expansion of the dual language, language programs that you have kind of thinking about what that can look like. And then, you know, we had a pretty good conversation around that some of this is about educating your community that um, and, and helping your community to embrace that um, what we're talking about in the future requires new ways of learning, right? That what worked for you in school is not going to work for the kids today, right? And so thinking about that. We also talked about the need um, to create uh, welcoming environments, that balance between safety and security and, and creating um, a, a sense of belonging and a sense of welcoming and that those two were not an either or, but an and and. Um, and the last thing that we, uh, we, we got into, um, sorry, we also talked about then, what does that mean for families, right? How do you create resources, access to, to community spaces or creation of spaces where your community, where your building can kind of expand its hours and expands its um, its resourcefulness to your community. Um, and then the last thing that we kind of uh, uh, were, were ending on before we wrapped up was just that schools really need to have a sense of personalization, that students um, should have that sense of agency, of autonomy, and, and that, you know, as, as John was talking about, that may be him having to let go of the fact that, you know, graffiti may not may not be um, va uh, vandalism, but, but an expression of art, right? And so um, what does it mean to allow kids to be kids and create spaces that, that really belong to the kids? Um, and that may require that some folks in your community, and certainly some of us as, as adults, think differently about what is acceptable, quote unquote, in schools. Did I miss anything from our group? Is there anything that we talked about that I didn't share? Okay. Uh, Allison, will you share kind of the themes in your room? Yeah, I clearly went for a chaotic cluster method. So different, different learning uh, styles. But I, in green, I kind of started to highlight some of the themes that we talked about. I had the great pleasure of having uh, both Cecilia and Brian in my group. So there's definitely an emphasis on facilities. Thanks, y'all. Uh, but I think that there was really a strong theme coming through of like programs that really set students up for success in the future. And kind of getting back to some of these programs that, you know, maybe some folks had when they were in high school, but don't exist anymore, like personal finance or having an opportunity for students to like run a bank or engage in a bank so that they can learn some of those skills, even if we're not necessarily learning how to balance a checkbook anymore, uh, but they can still have those personal finance skills. Things like nursing, gardening, auto shop, home ec, wood shop, a lot of those things that will get folks um, learning with kind of getting their hands dirty, um, having different kinds of experiences and setting them up for long-term success in life and exposing them to a lot of different career opportunities. There's also a, a great comment about not just limiting this to high school, like also including this in middle school programming and even elementary learners. Uh, there was a lot of excitement about outdoor school in my group as well. So I think expanding on those kinds of things that will give students illuminating experiences. Um, you know, we also know that often people of color have less access to the outdoors or can sometimes feel less safe in the outdoors. So doing things like that will also increase um, accessibility and inclusivity across all students. We also talked a little bit about engagement. This was mostly from my prodding of the group, but noting that, you know, frankly, a lot of the parents that are coming and asking for programs um, are, are white and tend to be um, more highly educated. So those, you know, families of color, people whose identities are can be more in the margins, aren't necessarily the folks who are advocating for different kinds of programs. So there is a gap there to see, well, what do these families need? And what do these students need? And ensuring that there's really intentional outreach to center those voices as well. So it's not just the loudest voices that'll dictate what kind of programming will go into a school. Um, we talked about welcome and that's where we definitely talked about facilities, but hey, no sweat, knowing that the some of many of the buildings in the school district are not particularly welcoming, um, that the entryways need to balance security and welcome, but that there could be work done to kind of increase that sense of welcome, of belonging, things like bilingual signage, um, 
and just, you know, doing some tweaks to make it feel a little bit more like, hey, you all are welcome here. And then we talked about accessibility and noting that, you know, it's kind of hit or miss. Like there, there are things, there are places where it, it can be super accessible. And then there are also some interesting design quirks. Um, I think, especially in the elementary school uh, that, you know, aren't really accessible. And those that's both for students and for staff. So even if you had a staff in a wheelchair, you know, that, that could be a really challenging thing. So again, I think that theme of welcome extends to access. So can everybody do all these things? Are they kind of just like off on the side, you know, having to, to access a ramp or, or go to a different bathroom or something like that? So again, we focus a lot on facilities, but I think there's some really, um, some concurrent themes with Karina's group as well. So thanks, thanks Alison. Last but certainly not least, Alisa, will you give us kind of an overview of what you all talked about? Yeah, so I'm actually kind of building on um, some of what Allison was talking about with her group um, related to engagement. We started out um, discussing, you know, recognizing that um, the district has struggled um, uh, to engage, um, particularly its Latinx families, in um, both being aware of um, program offerings and services and um, actively uh, participating. And there's some exploration around, you know, so what, what are the barriers um, to achieving that um, involvement? And then even in recognition that maybe um, there was, a, 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 you know, kind of a, an expectation that, um, that those families would be involved in, involved in um, a particular way that might not um, align with their cultural experience. And so maybe they are involved, um, but it's just not like how, what we think it should look like, right? Um, so an example was given like that some uh, Latinx um, cultures, they, um, they view the teacher as, um, they have a lot of respect for the teacher and will be hesitant to, um, to you know, to do anything that would seem um, kind of like with what Allison was saying with her group, you know, that I'm actively uh, advocating a program that might seem like it's being critical or, um, or questioning and, um, and that might not be a comfortable exchange um, for some families. Uh, so, you know, some of the barriers, other barriers that were talked about, um, technology, um, and that, that a lot of uh, communications happen electronically, and even um, we can't make the assumption that just because somebody has a phone that they um, have the, uh, the techno technological um, skills to be able to, or, you know, or uh, desire to, you know, monitor emails, um, social media, things like that, that might not be something that um, that's part of their daily life. Um, so how can we increase technological literacy, access to technology, um, transportation barriers um, and scheduling barriers were discussed, um, and um, communication barriers, you know, recognition that, um, that the district um, could try different means of reaching these families and, um, and hoping, you know, connecting them with these service, uh, services. Um, there's also a uh, talk about um, uh, providing students with a sense of resiliency and um, similar to the other groups, right, being able to, um, to function as adults and um, also talked about um, the fact that, you know, it's, it's really, it's a very daunting um, task that we have in front of us because um, schools are community um, resources that we're entrusted with and, um, and the, the needs can feel kind of overwhelming and how do we prioritize and fund um, the needs for all students that it just seems it seems overwhelming. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, talked about making connections with um, city planning agencies, um, particularly around one example that was given, you know, um, uh, creating bike paths um, or safe routes to schools, um, thinking though also what is developmentally appropriate, so what might be appropriate for um, for older elementary kids, middle school kids, and um, high schoolers uh, would not be um, uh, necessarily, would not necessarily work for younger kids. Um, let's see. Oh, and then um, in terms of uh, thinking about um, CTE opportunities and expanding the types of experiences we want to provide to students, um, wondering if, you know, do we do we have to be everything to everyone? Like, can we work with neighboring districts um, perhaps to provide some of these opportunities um, and, you know, so not feel like we have to actually construct everything locally um, and which will, would, you know, be infeasible, but by creating partnerships, we could have this offer the same types of experiences by kind of leveraging those relationships. Cool. 
Thank you. Anything else, room three, that Lisa didn't hit upon? Okay. Well, um, we are, we have actually exceeded the end of our time. Uh, so our next meeting will be on the 18th. So two weeks from today. Um, what we'll do is we'll take the input that we received today and we'll create a draft set of guiding principles based on that. Um, and then bring that back to you all to, to refine and to, to finalize that list. And then um, we'll get into some of that data that um, we were talking about earlier um, uh, to look at both the building condition and the education adequacy assessments, and then start to say, okay, we spent all this time talking about kind of um, kind of bigger picture ideas. Now, what are the physical implications of that, right? What are the implications for design and space and place? Um, and, and then that can um, allow us to kind of think further into what our capital improvement plan will be. So we'll see you all, um, same bat time, same bat channel in a couple of uh, weeks. Thank you so much for, for giving us of your time, for giving us of your um, attention um, when we know there are a lot of things calling your attention um, these days, but uh, thanks for joining us in this important work. Anything else, Jen? Thing, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, we were going to ask if, um, in terms of scheduling meetings three and four, um, how people felt about um, conducting both meetings in September versus September, early October, um, recognizing kind of school schedules. And, and so wanted to just kind of get a pulse on that. Are people feeling like- I'm gonna advocate for my building principals who are on here. I would say if it's the latter part of September, even if we went back to back weeks, and again, I'm looking at a little bit of Julie Cease, Nicole, um, you know, if it's later in September, I think that that would be, I think the first couple of weeks, it's just with school going, not just as, as bananas. Yeah. yeah. So if, if, I think that if, if, if people could just look at their calendars, if that's potentially an option of maybe the last couple of weeks of, of uh, September to be able to, to pull that off, that would, I mean, I think that would be better. And then we could get that complete. And then my other question was just going to be, um, because this was recorded, because we do have a couple of people that we knew couldn't make it today. Um, is it possible that we get that record? Well, Emily, I'm a, I, I guess I think I'm Emily that probably right. has it. Yeah. To is it okay for us to share with the committee members yep. that weren't present? Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and then oh. just the, like the calendar, there happened to be five Thursdays in September, so the 22nd and 29th would be the last two weeks of September. The latest, then, if you just Pick one of those October 6th would be a Thursday. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Emily and, and Elisa will work together and then we'll get that out to everybody because we want to, we know that more than what the date is, it's important to let you know it well enough in advance. So that way you can um, put it on your calendar. So um, we and then do, do that. Do we know about whether we want to do Zoom or whether we want to try and meet in person next time or how do we feel about that? I think the next meeting could be fine in Zoom. Um, it might be the one after that where if we're if we're wanting to work in small groups and build kind of our our um, our um, what are they called the capital improvement plan? What's that called? I, I do this for a living. What the heck is it called? Um, that may be places where we want to be um, in smaller groups. But I think um, I think we can play it by ear, um, depending on kind of like I said where we are spike wise in terms of. I know that um, recently, the reason we went to Zoom is because we heard from the district that it was just, it felt like everybody in district was was uh, was getting COVID at the time. So we can see where we are. Perfect. So I'll send out Zoom invites to everybody um, again for the 18th and we'll just move forward from there and just kind of. Yeah, our, unless somebody overwhelmingly feels like we have to meet in person. Um, I know that there are some folks that want to meet virtually. And so in order to kind of be equitable in how we do what we wanted to. And we this, may we may yeah. have a solve for that. <laughs> I'm looking at Cease. We we purchased some the, equipment. Your owl. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So I think that if um, if we go virtual the next meeting meeting and then um, because we do our sort of have that and then move towards, I think we have a couple spaces that are big enough that okay. even if we have a if we're still in the red, we could space ourselves out. We'll be okay. All right, everyone. Well, thank you again for your time. Um, have a wonderful evening um, and enjoy what is supposed to be a pretty hot weekend. So hopefully try and stay cool. Thanks again. Thank See you well, everyone. Thanks. Thanks Bye.